And remind you that we have a potluck today. Today we're studying lesson number 10 in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Does everyone have a quarterly? Okay. We're studying a very interesting uh, lesson this week. The reason that it's interesting is uh, because it's a warning. God impresses Peter to warn the believers in the five provinces in Asia Minor five Roman provinces in Asia Minor, just north of the Taurus Mountains. And 2 Peter chapter 2 is warning the believers in this geographical area that uh, false teachers intend to deceive them and distort the scriptures in regards to Jesus' second coming and whether that's a valid biblical truth. Let's take a look at uh, two of the words in our title today. The word prophecy is unfortunately associated with the prediction or the foretelling of an event to occur in a specific period of time. Specific period of time. As Adventists, we're familiar with the 2300 day year prophecy and the 1260. Some people, unfortunately, are not familiar with uh, the 1290 year prophecy and the 1335 year prophecy. And that's unfortunate because that speaks to our time. We should be very familiar, very familiar with uh, Daniel chapter 12, where those two prophecies appear. But that's not what we're studying this morning. What we're studying is two words, prophecy, which can also speak of an inspired speaker or an inspired writing. And that's what the word scripture means, an inspired writing. Okay? Now, I don't know of anyone better qualified than the Apostle Peter to warn people about possibly being deceived. Deception is something that you and I Although this letter was written for the believers in the five provinces of Asia Minor, of Rome, it has a specific application, I believe, to us today, if you're familiar with Seventh-day Adventist history. That is not blasphemy that I've just said. That is not blasphemy. If you believe that the seventh church will be blessed with the spirit of prophecy, or the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 19, 9, 10. If you believe that, then you should be very sensitive to the things that God inspired one of the founders of our church, a woman, with a third grade education. Does that shock you? That messes some scholars' heads up. <laughs> Really bothers them. But the evidence is overwhelming that God did use her. Amen. And if you have any questions about whether God used her or not, I highly urge you to read just one of her prophecies, or one of her visions, rather. One of her visions. It's known as the Salamanca vision. The Salamanca vision began. Uh, the early part
part of November 1902, I think it was. I may not have the year correct. But in the early, the first four days of November. And uh, she was traveling and she was in Salamanca, New York. That's where the prophecy began. And I say began because the prophecy was not given to her at one time. He gave her a little piece of the prophecy. And the moment that she tried to repeat to someone that she thought might be blessed by the prophecy being revealed, the moment she started to utter it, she forgot it. Then, a few weeks later, God gave her another little piece of the vision. And again, she tried to share it with others, and she forgot it. God took the vision away from her. What are visions for? To share with others. Then sometime later, God gave her another piece of the prophet, of the vision, of the event. And again, she tried to share it with others. Boom! She forgot. It. To the point that when she got back to Battle Creek in March for the general conference meeting, she got up in front of 4,000 people and tried to relate the vision. And she forgot it. And people in the audience were saying, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. We've never seen this happen before. Then, as the general conference meetings progressed, there was a meeting among the leaders of the church. And they met from about midnight to three in the morning. And they discussed a very, very sensitive topic about one of the publications of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and what should be and what should not be included in that publication. Because if some things continue to be included in that publication, it was very likely that the readers, especially non-Seventh-day Adventists, would be turned off to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So this was a very, very contentious issue that the leaders of the church were involved in. At 3 o'clock in the morning, the meeting ended. Now, that afternoon, previously to that meeting, from midnight to 3 o'clock, the president of the General Conference, Olson, had asked Ellen White if she would be meeting with them first thing in the morning, next day. And she says, no. Okay? So she's asleep that evening, and at 3 o'clock, an angel awakens her, and she starts writing. Her son, Willie White, and A.T. Jones, going to the meeting at 5 o'clock in the morning, Notice that her light is on, and so they knock on her door, and they said, are you okay? And she says, I certainly am. And she says, I'm going with you to this meeting. And they said, okay. And so the three of them walk in, and the president of the general conference also says, Sister White, we're so happy that you joined us. Do you have a message for us? Indeed I do. So, she's given precedent to get up and relate what began in the first four days of November, the year before, and now was completed after three o'clock in the morning. And she gets up and she relates the entire vision. No pause. No forgetting. Just... Boom, straight through. And she sits down. And she hears sobbing in the audience. And one by one, all of the men that were in that meeting from midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning got up who were against that publication, including articles about the Sabbath and the observance of the Sabbath. We want to delete those articles because it 
might turn people off to the magazine. One by one, every one of those men that were against, including Sabbath articles in that magazine, got up and confessed. One of them said, you have articulated word for word everything that I said last night. And I am sorry, and I ask God to forgive me. I will never resist, including Sabbath articles in that publication. Amen. And she said, Last night, everything that I just related to you was consummated last night. I'm not promoting Ellen White, okay? But if you have a question in your mind as to whether God used her to send specific messages to this church, I urge you to read that vision. It's called the Salamanca Vision. There's a publication in the library here called The Return of the Latter Rain. Title. The return of the latter rain. In the very last chapter, 17, that Salamanca vision is recorded. Now, what does that have to do with our lesson this week? It has to do with the issue that Peter is writing these believers that they are about to be deceived in regards to the Sabbath, Jesus' second coming. That's what it has to do with. And I don't know of anyone better qualified than the Apostle Peter to talk about deception. Peter was obviously one of the twelve disciples that Jesus called to follow him. Let's take a look. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. That's one of our scriptures this week at verses 16 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 16 to 21. And as you're looking, when you get there, the first thing that I want for you to look for is whether your Bible has a subheading, subheading between verses 15 and 16. And if it does, would you share it audibly with us? The, trust, the trustworthy prophetic word. The trustworthy prophetic word. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else have a subheading? Between verses 15 and 16, 2 Peter chapter 1. Anyone? Okay? Same thing. Okay. Anyone else? Did you say the trustworthy prophetic Yeah. Okay. Mine says one word. Eyewitnesses. What is an eyewitness? Someone has seen it for themselves. Someone that's what? Seen it for themselves. Seen, seen it for themselves. They've seen something. So, what is it that they have seen? Let's take a look at verses 15 and 16. I mean 16 to, and 17 to begin with. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His what? Who is the we here? In addition to Peter. The other disciples. Those around. Okay. In this case, it's a very specific group of people. Let, take a look at 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic Glory. This, quote, is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. And then, he says something very interesting. In verse 18. Continuing the sentence, begun in verse 17. And we ourselves heard this utterance. So they have not only been what? Witnesses? But what? They heard something. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from where? Heaven. When we were with him on the holy mountain. What event is that? Transfiguration. Yes. This all turned to Mark 
chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And we're going to scrutinize something here. Who would like to volunteer to read Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 8? Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Volunteer. Okay, Diane. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shiny, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly... When they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Thank you. Why did the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, why did they feel that it was necessary or beneficial for Peter, James, and John to what? See and hear what you just read. Why do you think the Godhead felt that was important? I think it was evidence. Evidence from the person, the people who actually were there to give a testimony that would last forever. And what was the testimony about? The transfiguration. The holiness of God. Jesus. What was Jesus' mission? Save How? Resurrection. Restore. I think it gave them strength too after the crucifixion. What? He had to identify with the human race. Ah. Is it important to, for God? the Son, and the Holy Spirit to abide by the same rules that He asks us to abide by. Yes. Is that important? Yes. 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 If they didn't abide by the same rules that they applied to us, who would say, foul play, time out? Yes. Is the, is the devil acquainted with the scriptures? Yes. Better than all human beings and their minds put together for 6,000 years. Okay. What is the significance of other events that the 12 disciples were eyewitnesses to and heard. Who would like to read Mark 8 verses 17 through 21? Mark 8. We just read Mark 8 1 through 8. Mark 9, I'm sorry. 1 through 8. Now we're going to go to the left. Mark 8. And who would like to volunteer to read verses 17 through 21? Over here, Jim. Nice to see you. Yes, thank you. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye? For ye have no bread, perceive ye yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? 
having ears, hear ye not, and do ye not remember? When I break the first five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Is that a fair question for Jesus to ask his disciples? Would you be impressed if Jesus or someone took five or seven loaves of bread, I'm, I'm sorry, five or, uh, or, or four, and fed four to five thousand people? Would that get your attention? Yes. <laughs> Where would it get your attention? Because what we're talking about here this morning is... What is Jesus appealing to? Is he trying to impress through the transfiguration his three disciples and what Jim just read, is he trying to impress the twelve disciples about his mission and his power? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. But where is it landing at this point in time? No. Who would like to read Mark 8, 27-33? Mark 8, 27 to 33. Volunteer. Okay, right here. Now oh. Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to them, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Thank you. Again, what is happening here? Why is Jesus performing these miracles? Obviously to help a human being that is in physical need. But what is why is he doing this in front of his twelve disciples? He's trying to give them a heart appreciation. Ah. He's trying to get them to move from what they're seeing and hearing and to move down here. And he is probably the best qualified to do this. Okay, what else do we know that disciples were witnesses to in John 11? You don't need to look it up. The resurrection of Lazarus. Would that get your attention? <laughs> The question is, what effect did these visual demonstrations of God's power through Christ and what they heard, what effect did they have on the disciples? Let's go to scripture here. This is crucial. This is absolutely <clears throat> crucial. Because the creator of the universe came to this earth 2,000 years ago and performed all of these things that we're reading. For approximately three and a half years, 12 men that he handpicked, not only saw, but heard this. What is the final result after Jesus' ministry? What is the final result of all of these things that they saw and heard? Please turn to Luke 22, verse 24. When you're there, say ready. 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 Who would like to read verse 24 for us of Luke chapter 22? Do you have a subheading for between verse 24 and 23? Who is the greatest? 
Who is the greatest? The disciples argue about greatness. Very good. That's the issue. argument about greatness. Okay. So they've seen all of these demonstrations of God's power. They've not only seen it, but heard it. And after three and a half years, the creator of the universe, teaching, preparing them to take over the work after he leaves, what is the final result? What is the, what is the grade that they get for their one question test, final exam? Who would like to read verse 24? And there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. Thank you. What grade would you give 12 men that observed all the things that we've been reading to demonstrate God's power? What grade would you give to 12 individuals that saw all this for three and a half years? The same thing I would give myself. Well, I would probably give them not an F. I would give them an F minus. <laughs> but the correct thing is what the pastor said. A loving Heavenly Father gave him an incomplete. <coughs> and I asked that question in one of the sermons that I give, and that's the answer that I give. He gave him an incomplete. What do you and I learn from this? That we are a lot like that. We really need the Holy Spirit. Amen. But Jesus gives them an incomplete instead of an F minus. Now, after the Last Supper, Jesus continues to prepare his disciples for, for coming events. Let's turn now to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. <clears throat> when you get to Matthew 26, say you're ready. And I'd like a volunteer to read verses 30 through 35. <clears throat> the reason that I'm spending this time on eyewitness is because Peter is telling the people that he's writing his letter to, hey, you need to believe what we're saying to you. We were eyewitnesses. We were not only eyewitnesses, but we heard it. And after three and a half years, and listening to the one that they admitted was a what? The Christ? That was the Messiah. That's what the word means in Greek. The Messiah. After listening to him for three and a half years, Healing people, raising people from the dead, they're arguing among themselves as to who's going to be the greatest in a kingdom which obviously they still perceive as an earthly kingdom. Now, let's take a look at Matthew 26, 30-35. Now it gets pretty personal. Who would like to volunteer to read verses 30-35? Anyone? Okay. Mary Jane? And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the shepherd of the flock will be scattered. The sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you this, that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. They've seen him heal people. They've seen him transfigured. Uh, they've seen him walk on the water. And who else joined him in the water? Peter. A writer. The writer of 2 Peter. Chapter 1. 
That's what we're studying today, verses 16 to 21. And what's the purpose of 2 Peter? Chapter 1, 16 to 21. To warn the people in the five provinces, Roman provinces in Asia Minor, that they are about to be deceived because false teachers are going to prove to them from where? Scripture that there's no such thing as a second coming of